Hey everyone, welcome to the Walk to Wealth podcast. If you're tuning in live with us on Facebook, if you're tuning in on YouTube, make sure to do us one favor. Make sure to follow and subscribe so you never miss a beat. I am bringing out the best of the best this year. It's going to be an amazing year. Without further ado, let's get right into this episode. Rebecca, I'm super excited to be interviewing today and let's get right into it. For those of you that may not know you, tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Who am I? So my name is Rebecca Rose. One of the things that I do is I run a Facebook group called Wealth Building 2.0 with the president of Keller Williams Realty International, Mark King. It has been a passion project of his for many years in our locally owned offices. And then during COVID, we moved it to Facebook and went from engaging with 30, 40 agents each week to 100 plus people live on Friday mornings. And the Facebook group is just over 14,000 members right now. So we're really excited about the reach of teaching everyday people that they can build wealth. In my spare time, I work at Keller Williams Realty International as the divisional operations manager. And I have been a real estate agent for over 20 years. I'm also married and have two kids. <laughs> Amazing. And I think a great place to start, right, is I always ask my guests, tell us about their walks for wealth. I want to know, what was it like when you were back, all the way back when you were like little Rebecca, still in diapers? What was money like in, growing up in your household? What was the topic of like of abundance and what was it like growing up? What were some of the things that you learned early on that might have either served you or might have kind of been to your detriment? And you had to kind of work to get those, I guess, subconscious beliefs kind of taken care of in your adult life. What was it like growing up? I am very blessed, very privileged to have grown up in a house where we never had a lot of money, but we were never missing anything we needed. So always had a roof over my head. My parents were very frugal with money, so mm. they saved money. I said, if you ever asked my mom for anything starting on December 26th, you'd get it for Christmas that year, the next year. like. She just kept everything. You needed socks, Christmas. You need deodorant, Christmas. Like it was a <laughs> Christmas thing. We always had food on the table, roof over our head. I always had school supplies. And I always knew that money was a little tight. So it wasn't an abundant mindset. It was more of a scarcity mindset. And it was also very typical American life. My dad worked, my mom stayed at home. They believed debt was bad. So I was always kind of coached, don't use credit cards, don't buy things you can't afford. We lived a very, a life below our means, even though we didn't have a lot of money, we even lived below that. But I didn't know that things could be different. We talked about good debt and bad debt, a mortgage and car payments. Everyone has those. That's okay. Get a great W-2 job, work hard, contribute to your 401k, retire one day. <laughs> that was all I really knew. And then I got married and my husband was very much the same way. We lived below our means, but I didn't know that normal people didn't have car payments. I didn't know that normal people could pay off houses. I thought this is just life. You'll always have these bills. And I didn't have a lot of professional success for the majority of my life. So even though we did have money and we weren't suffering, we didn't think about it as like planning for the future and how do we set up passive income streams and how do we have multiple economic engines and what does our expense control look like? And all of these things that I got introduced to, let's say seven years ago, I was already 41. So it's not like someone introduced these things to me when I was 16 <laughs> or 17. When you're 41, you have this whole sense of, can I even catch up? Is there yeah. even enough time to live differently and change things. Luckily, Gary Keller says you can be anywhere you want in, I believe, five years, you truly can. And so by working with people who had big vision and were willing to coach me and answer my questions and hold me accountable, I was able to make a lot of changes in just seven years. Yeah, no, that's an amazing story. And I love the, you kind of mentioned without mentioning it, but like the conveyor belt of life, right? The You're born and then you kind of get brought into school and you kind of make your way into higher levels of schooling and then you make your way to a job and then you make your way to retiring and eventually getting off the conveyor belt, kicking the bucket, right? And a lot of people never get off of that conveyor belt, which is kind of the reason why I started this podcast because for me, my epiphany was rich dad, poor dad. It was during the pandemic while well, everything was still like massively uncertain. This is when I, at the height of it, November, 2020 it was. 
And that was enough to shift my paradigm enough to make me realize there's another way of viewing the world out there that wasn't being taught in school. And fast forward about a year from that time that I read that book, about a year and a month after that, that's when I finally started this podcast that we're on now. And I've been doing it a little over a year, a little over a year now to help other young people kind of see that there's another way of viewing the world. So I want to kind of ask you a little bit now, what was that that turning point? What made you finally push, I, I guess, tipped over your, your perspective and make you realize what was that epiphany that you had that made you realize that there's another way of viewing the world? Well, first of all, congratulations on actually starting and launching a podcast. Lots of people talk about it and a lot of people don't do it. And for finding the silver lining in COVID, because one of the things that COVID taught us is jobs we thought were safe, were not safe. Mm -hmm. Owning your own business was not as safe as you thought if the government decides you can't be open. And yeah. so really things that people thought would never be an issue, working women, my kids go to school, I'm good. Well, not a school's not open, but you're still expected to work. So really we figured out so many different things there and a lot of it could be silver linings for making people think differently going forward. My big shift was, and I still remember this and somewhere in my hoarding boxes, I think I still have the piece of paper, I'm gonna have to find it and take a picture of it. So. Most people know that I took a job at a Keller Williams Market Center because my husband lost his job. I needed to make mm -hmm. some money while he looked. I fully intended to quit the job as soon as he got a new job because I did not want to work full time because that seemed horrible. And I was lucky enough that he made enough money that we were fine. We weren't going to be multiple millionaires, but we were fine. And so I started working for Mark King. And when I started working for him, I immediately realized that there was a lot of opportunity with this man. He owned a lot of different businesses. He was very entrepreneurial. He was a hot mess, so he needed my help. So I could figure out that I could do certain things that would help make him even more successful. And then he read a book, and I'm not sure what the name of the book is. So maybe someone who's listening knows, or maybe. And it basically got boiled down to that however much money you want to make, you need to make sure that at least one person in your life, you're helping them make, like you're gonna make 10X of what they make. So Mark was like, you know what? I wanna make a million dollars a year. It means you need to make 100,000. And I was like, Mark, I make like 50 grand a year. I don't know how I'm gonna make 100 grand. I never thought I would make six figures in a year. Okay. And he was like, no, no, I'm serious, sit down. And I was like, okay. And Mark just turned over a scrap of paper and he was like, okay, what's your base salary? And I was like, 45,000. He's like, okay, 45,000. And what's the bonus? And I'm like, the bonus could be like two grand a month, but we don't really hit it. Well, what if we hit it every month? I was like, okay, so 24 grand a year. Okay, so now we're already at 70. Okay, how do we get you an extra $30,000 a year? I think you'd make a great maps coach. And I was like, a maps coach? He's like, yeah. We could get you a few clients. You're really good at what you do. You could start coaching. We could probably get you 30 grand a year there. Oh, and I need help with this other business and that could do this. And he just kind of started throwing a bunch of things together. And then he's like, there, 100 grand a year. And I was like, and I just kind of wandered out. I was like, okay. And the fact that to him, his economic thermostat, which we talk about a lot on wealth building, to him, 100 grand wasn't a lot. So him kind of sketching out how someone could make a hundred grand was so simple to him. And he had so much faith where to me, I'm sitting there going, you want me to double my salary? How am I going to double my salary? I, I, my brain literally broke in that moment and reformed. And I was like, okay, this is possible. So when someone else shows me something's possible, I'll do it. I would have never been the person to break the four minute mile, but I would have been in the next group of 10. Uh, Cause I would say, Oh, well, John can do it. I can do it. Like, I'm a mm -hmm. big believer of like other humans can figure it out. I can figure it out. And I'm like, I get to work with this man every day who thinks so big, who teaches <laughs> on wealth building, who just scribbled on a piece of paper how I could make more money than I ever thought I would make. I got to start listening. I got to mm -hmm. start being more open minded. I have to remove my limiting beliefs around that. The other thing that happened that was a big game changer for me was even before the hundred thousand dollar conversation when mark and i were interviewing together i remember saying to him i have a college degree i'm pretty smart and really the only thing i'm good at is being a secretary and he's like what do you mean 
And I was like, <laughs> I know it's like my family's greatest disappointment that I have this degree and I should be this something. And really what I'm good at is being someone's assistant. And he's like, no, he goes, don't say it like that. You're an operations person. And I was like, what? And he was like, you're an operations person. There's CEOs and there's COOs. Don't diminish what you can do. He's like, you are operationally minded, but that doesn't mean that you're going to spend the rest of your life getting coffee. It means that you just need to find the right partner. And when you find the right partner, then you're going to be able to do bigger things as that person does bigger things. And that really changed my whole mindset around what I was capable of doing and not going, well, I fought it, but what I really am is an assistant. <laughs> Yeah. I've tried to fight it, but I can't fight it off because that's what I like doing and it's what I'm really good at. So those two things together made me think completely differently about my opportunity to build wealth and changing my economic thermostat around making six figures. Yeah. And then I got to work with Mark every day. And every Friday he was teaching wealth building in person in our market center and I knew other people that he had helped them reach passive income levels that were above their bills. And so once again, seeing those people and thinking, well, there's nothing really special about them. If Mark was able to help them, he could help me. So the kind of the coupling of those three things really changed everything for me in my 40s. Yeah, it's something that's so hard to do, right? Adding an extra digit to your income. And especially when you don't come from much, it's something so hard. I remember, so one one of the things I do, so are you familiar at all with the Pivot Shift group at all? Yeah, uh, with James, James Shaw. Yeah. So I've been a big part of that community. And although my main focus isn't real estate anymore, it's really just growing this podcast. One of the things I do every now and then is I do social, social media classes. So I just taught one about a couple of weeks ago from the time we're recording this on how to leverage chat GPT to create social media content. And that thing blows my mind. I'm an old it's, person and watching that thing blows my mind. I said, all of us have to be scared. Yeah. All of us need to be scared. It's here. It's yeah. smarter than us. And at least so for me, it's like now they're fi it's finally starting to get mainstream a little bit. But I, I, I taught before it kind of really hit mainstream, mainstream. So it's like I was a couple weeks ahead. So I was teaching them that. And from that class, um, I did free and I upsold to the workshop. And I made about like four grand from that. But like last year, this time I taught my first social media class and I kid you not, like they were in, well, it was my first one. The second class I taught was also a free class. The first ones I did were free, like entirely free, like no upsells or anything. And the second one, they were like, John, what is your Zell? What is your this? We, how can we pay you? And I was like, I just, I didn't realize until then, but there was something in me that wasn't even accepting of money. It's like, I don't know what it was, it's like whether... It was like internally as something I can't still put my finger on it, but it's almost something I that's like I wasn't okay with accepting money for whatever reason. And having to shift my mindset knowing that I provided value and so this is a way of them saying thanks was something that I had to work on because it's like when you don't have a lot, it's like you're not used to anything and when you're not used to anything, it's like, well, maybe it's not for you. And after a while it's like you're just I kinda adopt that mindset that maybe success or money isn't for you. And it's a lot to kind of rewire and things like that. And it's hard to um, kind of step over that when you're still like in the trenches, still like getting it going. Oh, I, if you would have asked me seven years ago, I would have said, I'll never have a career. That ship has passed. Like I, I never really found what I was good at. I'm a stay at home mom. I hang out with my kids. I, I do side <laughs> work. I pick up part-time jobs every now and then, but career career world isn't really for me. I would have told you that. And it wasn't until I found what I'm good at and was able to go do this other thing that it even opened my mind to that. But I'm the same way, John. I mean, I had OP call me and say, would you come out to my market center and just talk to my team and kind of do some consulting? And I was like, sure. And he's like, I'll pay for your travel. I was like, great. And he goes, how much do you charge? And I said, nah, I'll come for free. He said, don't say that. And I said, what? I go, I like you. We're friends. If you pay for my travel, I'll come for free. He goes, no, your time's worth something. $1,000 a day. And I was like, $1,000 a day? Dude, that's dumb. I would help you for free. And he's like, <laughs> don't do that. And I'm like, oh, but it's hard, right? Because yeah. I'm a helpful person. I always believe anything good I do comes back to me. 
I believe in God. I believe God works all things for good. And so whenever somebody's like, well, what would you charge? I'm like, you don't have to pay me. It's always my first yeah. thought is you don't have to pay me. I'll just do it. But you're right. We have to get open to that when people see value and want to pay us, we should be accepting for that and also realize that we do offer value and it is worth something. So that is a big mindset shift that I'm still working on. Yeah. And it's something that as you get as so for you, yeah, Mark King, for me, it was the pivot shift group. And I, I hate admitting that this quote was right because I used to say it wasn't right. But there's a quote about strangers will support you more than friends and family. And it wasn't oh, yeah. until I got into that group. And I was like, whoa. And like for me, like you're I think the third person from KW that I interviewed. And like it's every time I interview someone from KW because I'm also part of KW still myself. It's like it's something about this community, this culture that we kind of we created in this company that it's just the people here are just have this mindset that when you come up from humble beginnings, it's like, it's like you see like a new light almost. And it's like you view the world in ways that you probably would never view the world. And like the amount of MREAs I know now, it's like, that's even like, I didn't even know anyone at a first name yeah. basis that made more over than like a hundred thousand. And so it's like, now I get to talk to all these people and I'm also part of the wealth building 2.0 group that you guys are in. And it's like seeing all these different people at all these different levels of success and just being able to talk to these people really opens your mind. I remember my my operating principal from my office. They came back from the wealth the wealth the the wealth group. They had a, the when yeah, it first Tanner. yeah when it first opened up. They had like a, a an event I think, and I remember he came back to our, our Friday morning call, our, our morning calls, and he was sharing that the only way to attend and if you made a plan to get the fifty million. Now yeah. it's just like. People are planning to get to 50 million. I thought I was thinking big enough. And it's just like my mind just gets stretched and stretched. And not in a watching someone's pocket comparison is the thief right. of all joy kind of way. But in a like, I didn't even know that was possible. That's exciting. I know what I'm, I, what I'm aiming for is realistic. And it kind of like reassures me and, and justifies that what I'm aiming for isn't some surreal thing that's actually accomplishable in my lifetime. It's something that if I put my mind to, I can definitely get there. Kind of like we say in five years, you can get anywhere. So it's been a amazing opportunity being able to meet all these people and just like learn how to think about big things and make it seem like it's just the thing that everyone does kind of well it's the op it's the exercise that mark will walk through sometimes and he'll say rebecca do you think it's possible to make a thousand dollars a month passive income and i always go yep he goes why i go because i do and he's like five thousand i'm like yep because i do he's like 10 and i'm like yes because i'm close and then yeah. he'll go 50 and I'm like, Ugh, 50, pounds a month. <laughs> and he's like, why, why? It's just another zero. And he's like, and you know, people who do it. I'm like, that's true. I do know people that do it. And it goes back to that thing we talk about sometimes with your board of directors. When mm -hmm. you start just getting to interact with people who think bigger and think differently, your brain starts to change too, because you think, oh, well, that's, of course, it's a thousand dollars a day. Of course, passive income of $50,000 a month. I know people who make that. And so why not Why not me if them? And your quote was spot on and, and it's sad, but it is true. And I think the way I've heard it is a customer is more likely to become a friend than a friend is to become a customer. And really understanding that sometimes the people closest to you just don't support what you're doing. And then these other big thinking groups like the Pivot Shift Ahead group or the Wealth Building group or other groups within Keller Williams or even people who go to the gym with great people, those people yeah. are cheering for you because you're doing the same thing. You're in alignment. So that Pivot Shift Ahead group is amazing because you're in alignment with all these other people. And we come from an abundant company. We want to cheer each other on. I believe the better you do, the better we all do. So I'm yeah. excited you have a podcast. I hope it gets millions of viewers. I hope you become the first podcast billionaire. <laughs> that's awesome. Why? Because now that's someone who I know that's in my world doing things that's only going to make me better. You want to play a better yeah. game, play with better people. Yeah, that's, that, you are doing so, so eloquently, right? The the customer quote and that quote you just finished off where, where I'm, I'm definitely going to steal those two. And for me, I just came back from PodFest Expo not too long ago. And so like I've been trying to kind of find my pivot shift community in the podcasting space now that I'm really going all in onto this. And it's like going there, it's 
it's really these connections that you can make when you find people that are doing what you want to do. It's like, it'll fast track you. I was able to meet the MC for the entire event. So me and him are going to connect and collaborate. And then the closing keynote speaker, he's a guy that was playing ping pong. I thought it was cool. And so I went up to him and had just had a conversation with him. And I didn't know that he was going to be the closing keynote. And me and him were just talking over ping pong. And so like, he's just then a normal next, person. Exactly. And then me and him got, got to connect the next year. The MC connected with him, like came up to him to talk to him. And I just so happened to be in the right place at the right time. And so then I connected with the main MC for the event, all because I was just talking to him about ping pong. And now it's like, well, he's the closing keynote. This guy's connected with a bunch of people. And it's like, I was able to make some connections that I would have never known and realizing that the people that have all the things that we want and have the success and are already at where we want to get to are just regular people. And Keller Williams makes that such a, makes it apparent because like you go to family reunion. I went last year to family reunion and it's like these people you can just kind of talk to. And that's how I got Julia Lachey on the show. I kid you not. I'm not the, the, the proudest of it, but during mega camp, we were at this BRN mixer. Um, mm-hmm. And then I was already kind of a little tipsy at that point in time. <laughs> and so was she. And then we were just talking because we had a, met originally at family reunion and we were catching up. And then we mentioned the podcast. Then I ended up getting her on. And it was like, we were just at that point in time, just two people at a networking mixer. That's all it was. Yeah. Look, and we were able to connect. I don't know if you're a person of faith or not, but one of my favorite oh, yeah, things that people say about God is God does not call the equipped. He equips the called. So when you follow his call, he puts the right resources in place for you. And so yeah. I, I, there's a book called God Winks that I love. And so when you're someplace following your passion, then the resources kind of start to show up and you know that this is kind of the reverse of the donkey, right? Like the donkey yeah. kept trying to stop the person. The person wouldn't listen. This is God's way of winking at you going, you're at the right place. Look at the people yeah. who I've put in your path. Look at who you're meeting. I think it's such a big thing. And then when you talk about like finding your group of people who cheer you on, the book that I've been talking about on wealth building, like ad nauseum, I know, but I can't (laughs) stop talking about it, is The Purpose Factor. And they have a Facebook group of people who are following their purpose and sharing. And the amount of support in that group is huge from people who are just cheering you on. They're excited Mm -hmm. that you started your podcast. They're excited that you went to this event. They're excited that you got that speaker. They're excited that you made that money. Like they are yeah. all there kind of going, yes, it's possible. And that I think just keeps your momentum going. Whereas there's other people in life who would say things like, oh, well, you got paid that time. I bet you won't get paid again. Or yeah. yeah, but I bet you he won't actually call you back. Or all those kind of limiting beliefs, like those need to exit life. When you're doing something big, you just need to be like, okay, great. And go find someone who is excited for you and says, oh my gosh, that's amazing. That's awesome. So I think the more you see these people show up in your life, the more you realize that you're you're following the right path. These are your kind of your breadcrumbs. Yeah. And it's I love the fact that you brought up the purpose factor because that's what made me originally reach out to you. So a little bit of context. I don't think I shared this on the podcast, but so I, I'm a licensed realtor. I got licensed with KW back in September 2020. And then I was also at the time I was doing a podcast. And I was dropping weekly episodes and I was also doing social media classes. And I was also in real estate at a restaurant job working part time. So my real estate, a few things going on. Yeah. So real estate, my, my leads were falling through the cracks. I wasn't following up as I should. Prospecting was always easy for me. So it's like, I would get leads and then just let them slip through the cracks. But this SMMA, I was teaching classes, not really getting paid for anything. I was had hundreds of people sign up for classes and it's like, I wasn't making anything from it, but I was still spending, investing a lot of time in it. The podcast numbers were going down around that time, month after month. And then the restaurant, I originally planned to leave it back in February of last year. And I was still working at the restaurant. And so it's like all these things were kind of just like not going my way. And my plans were not unfolding the way I thought they would. And when you mentioned that book, I went and picked it up that I think I ordered it on Amazon either that same day or that weekend. And then it came in a couple of days after, I think the next following week. And I just I didn't run through the entire book and I went through the, and I really started thinking. And then I kind of diverged into turning the social media classes into a marketing agency. And so I got my mm-hmm. LLC for that, got that filed, and now I'm going to offer content creation services. And then my first client, I was like, I create content for other people, for myself. 
I really don't want to do this for other people. So I was like, well, I'm not focused on real estate anymore. And this this billion dollar idea that I had just had to scrap that up because that's not what I wanted to do. And then I started looking into this concept called Ikigai. Are you familiar with that, with that at all? No. It, it's something that we could probably bring up on a wealth putting call. But it's called, pretty much it's, it stands for your reason for being. It's a Japanese concept. And it's the oh, intersection. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just didn't know that's how yeah. you said it. Yes. Thank you, guys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. And so I stumbled into that, but it wasn't, the catalyst was really reading the purpose factor. And I just started spending a lot more time in, in deep thought, just reflecting. And that's what made me realize, like, I need to double down on the podcast. Like, despite all my distractions, the one thing I was doing consistently is the weekly episodes. And then December ended up being my best month. And then this past January was my was even better than December. And I spoke at Podfest Expo, which I came back from a couple of weeks ago from the time we're recording this. And it was like now like that I'm finally have all my focus and attention in one thing. I feel like God has been giving me blessings, but they've just been spread so thin because he's been blessing me in each different thing. And it's like right. now that I'm focused on one thing, it's like all my blessings are kind of getting funneled and siphoned into the podcasting industry. And it's been opening a lot more doors. And so, but it took me, I honestly forgot my train of thought. I get too deep into my own head sometimes. No, but. so it goes back to the purpose factor in this thing that we really need to have a purpose and follow the purpose and help others with our purpose to feel truly fulfilled. And when we spread ourselves too thin, it just doesn't work. It's the whole, one of the quotes is that God says, you have not because you ask not. Well, in the purpose yeah. factor, they said, you have not because you know not what you want. So you're not yeah. asking because you don't even know what to ask for because there's so many things going on. And there really is something to be said. I mean, Gary Keller wrote a book called The One Thing about yeah. focusing on one thing and digging your hundred foot hole to find oil, not a hundred one foot holes going, this isn't working. And so I think it's clear just with some of the stuff and the resources that you're seeing come together that, yeah, you're right. All of the, the spread thin blessings kind of went in one place. And now you're seeing this momentum with your podcast, which is amazing. Yeah. So let me ask you one question, because I know you read the purpose factor too. What would you say actually is your purpose because i know about seven or eight years ago that's when you had your epiphany and you realized that you were capable of more but being capable of more is still kind of widespread right when did you finally realize like this is my one thing that i am, am called to do that's bigger than me that's bigger than my career here that's bigger than just life itself like what is your purpose that you feel you've been called to so just recently, I've gotten a lot of clarity through the purpose factor and some coaching that I'm doing around that, that my purpose is to help remove the stigma of mental health concerns. I have lived with depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder for well over a decade. And for me, that's the same as telling someone I have diabetes. I am not going to be ashamed about it. I'm not going to hide it. I'm not going to minimize it. It is part of who I am. And I think that if more people felt empowered to speak about their mental health concerns and things that were going on with them, and then to see that no, there is no mental health diagnosis that is the end of the world. And for a lot of people, because we don't speak about it, because there is a stigma involved in it, when you hear a heavy, a heavier diagnosis, like a bipolar two diagnosis, you don't know what to do. You think this is the end. This is not everyday depression. This is something bigger. And so I want more people to feel like they can say, yeah, I have anxiety. Yeah, I struggle with that. Yeah, that's part of who I am. And here's how you can help me. One of the analogies I make is that if you ever have a friend who has diabetes or a life-threatening allergy, they will tell you, hey, look, I have diabetes. I usually manage it pretty well. And if you see any of these things happening, a Coke, a piece of candy, worst case scenario, I have insulin in my bag. Same for someone who's allergic to nuts. Hey, I try to stay away from peanuts, but on the accidental chance that something happens, if it looks like I can't breathe or if I look really out of it, I have an EpiPen, here's what you need to do, right? Your friends know how to help you. Well, when I got diagnosed with bipolar disorder, it took me a long time, but I finally got to the part where I would tell people, if you and I saw each other every day, John, I would say, look, I have bipolar disorder. Today, I'm probably like a nine out of 10 on goodness. 
if mm -hmm. I don't see myself, I'm empowering you to say to me, are you okay? You seem either kind of slow, kind of tired. You seem a little out of it. That's my depressive episode. Or you seem really angry. You're really aggressive. Like you're not being kind. That's me and mania. Call me out because there are things I can do, but I can only do them sometimes if other people point out to me, are you okay? And I want that to be our whole world. I don't want mm -hmm. anyone to hide. I don't want anyone to feel like they can't tell you what's going on with them. So I believe my purpose is to live an amazing life with bipolar disorder and encourage others to speak freely about the mental health concerns that they have. This is so powerful. And let me ask you, what did it take? Like, what was this, the process to uncover that? Because it, it takes usually a while to put it into words because a lot of times we have something in us that we can't really articulate in ways that we can express clearly to others. So like, what was the process that you had to go through to really uncover that purpose to a point where you could share it now, but like that in a snap of a finger to anyone who were to ask you? So it, it's been kind of a long process for me. I'm a slow learner. I've done a lot of start with why, find your why, all of those things. And it really wasn't until the purpose factor broke it down for me because of the way my brain works and it's very operational. In the purpose yeah. factor, they walk you through steps of kind of digging back through your history, how you were raised, skills you've gathered over time to really understand that. And then I had someone kind of come to me and say once, you're a fighter, like what gives you passion? What makes you like, I cannot stand by if this is happening, I'm going to stand up and say something. And I realized that it was anything that had to do with mental health or people feeling like they couldn't talk about it. I had a friend once who said to me, oh, well, my daughter just got diagnosed with bipolar. We're not telling anybody yet. We're not, we asked her not to say anything. And I said, why? Don't tell her not to tell anybody. So that's silly. Now you're basically telling her something's wrong with that. I mean, it's the yeah. same thing with, I, I got sober two years ago. I don't drink. When people say, why don't you drink? I said, cause I have a problem with drinking. And they're like, oh, well you don't seem like an alcoholic. I'm like, what does an alcoholic seem like? And so <laughs> I chose, I chose to stop drinking and a friend tell me, you can't be an alcoholic. You're sitting at this table and we're all drinking and you're fine. And I said, well, there's all different types of people who have trouble with alcohol. I have no trouble being sober. I have no trouble being really drunk. I have trouble having one or two drinks. So I've chosen not to have any drinks. This is, th but I think we should talk more about those things because what we end up with in this day of social media and social media is amazing for so many reasons. Yeah. And you see other people's highlight reel. You only see the good. And then when you have know your whole life, the good, bad, and the ugly, you think, oh my gosh, I suck at life. I'm not measuring up. So I want people to share more of the bad stuff. Share that some things are rough. Share that you had to stop drinking. Share that you got this diagnosis. Share that you don't know what to do with your kid because this is going on right now and it's really hard. Because all we see is, my kid won some world championship sporting event. My kid got on the Dean's list. My kid got into the best college ever. My kid's amazing. Well, that's great. And I love that. And you should be proud of your kid. But when we don't share any of the hard pieces, it makes parents going through hard seasons feel alone. And so my passion is to get more out there so that people who are doing amazing things but have hard things too. realize that that's really just life we all have hard things but i'm super passionate about mental health and just having people talk more about it it's been a big a big clarity piece to me that that is when i get fired up like yeah. i want to read about it i want to talk about it i want to know what's going on with you i want to share what's going on with me i was just part of a kickstarter for an app in the mental health space and all of that just brings me like excitement and passion and i think that's when you're kind of on the right track like you said before you started a content creation company and then you were like yeah. i don't love that yeah. that's okay great check it off your list <laughs> i don't love that so i'm not going to do it i think that's a big key 
is sometimes finding your passion or your purpose is more about what is it not? What yeah. am I doing where I go? Yeah, it's not that. That's that's not making me jump out of bed. And crossing those things off the list. I like. I think a lot of people like get too caught up in trying to find the one thing. And it's like, for me, even as far back as high school and middle school, whenever I took a multiple choice test, I would always eliminate answers for, unless I knew the answer like flat out, I would always eliminate answers first because that will decrease the number of options that I have, making my life super easy, right? You just cross off one option on a multiple choice test. You have a, now a 25% better chance to yes. get a better score, right? And you That's cross off like two options, it's 50% chance of getting a better score. That's how I teach people to pass the real estate test. I always go, look, <laughs> if you have no idea, start just looking at the answers. Are two of them the same? Because if they're basically the same, it can't be both of them. So cross them out. <laughs> now look at yeah. the other two. And it's the same thing. But there's a quote from Friends where they're making fun of Phoebe because Phoebe had had all of these jobs, all of these crazy jobs, right? And she got really serious, which Phoebe doesn't really get serious. And she said, what if I'm the best violinist the world has ever seen, but I never pick up a violin? And everybody just kind of looked at her. And it really stuck with me that unless I try things, I'll never know. Maybe mm -hmm. I am the best, I don't know, barefoot water skier the world has ever seen, and but I've never tried. You'll never know. So like for you, if you had never tried starting a content creation company, you might always wonder, should I have done that? But now you can say, I started that company. That's not what I wanted to do. So mm -hmm. really trying things is the key to getting closer to your purpose because you need that momentum of being in action because you're not just going to sit in a chair and go, oh, okay, this is it. You got to kind of keep trying things and working on things. Yeah. So let me ask you, right? Because a lot of people out there might be like me and try to try everything at the same time. So what would be your advice there for people that, you know, want to try a bunch of things, want to test out the waters, but not not giving a, a fair and honest effort into something is going to lead to failure anyways, not because it may not just be because it's not the thing you want to do, but like it may just be because so if you're someone like me, you're trying to do a lot, like way too much on your plate at the same time. So like, what do you recommend to those people that are similar to me that want to try everything and, but I, I just squirrels when it comes to like the shiny object syndrome and seeing something so i do agree that if you're not going to give it a hundred hundred and ten percent you're not gonna really going to be able to judge if you could be a success but i don't think you can find your purpose by looking for what you think will be successful or what you think will make you money i spent a lot of my life doing that thinking well i can't make money doing that i was putting that limiting belief on there so i'll go take this job right so one i've had a lot of jobs when you're young <laughs> have a lot of jobs you don't owe any company anything go work go do things but the second you realize that this is not your happy place this does not bring you joy start looking for the next opportunity no one really cares about job hopping anymore it's not a big deal in this mm -hmm. day and age and working from home and virtual work and all the options and side hustles People don't judge it like they used to. So one of the things that we talk about at Keller Williams is being in your genius. Your genius doesn't have to be your purpose, but it often aligns with it a little bit. And it's really looking at, do you look at what you're doing as a job, a career, or a calling? A job is, I get here, you pay me a certain amount per hour, I leave when my hours are up, I don't really think about this, outside of here because I don't actually care. I'm not looking to become the best store shelf stocker there ever was. I'm not researching the best ways to do this. I'm not adding anything. I come here, I get my money, I go home. And I have other more important things in my life, right? That's a job, a J-O-B. A career is, I like what I do, and I'm looking to go to the next level always. So I started as the, I cooked the fries at McDonald's and then I was the shift supervisor and then I was the assistant manager and then I managed and then I owned a franchise and I saw this very much as a career. I could see stepping stones. I don't know if I'm super passionate about McDonald's, but this is the career I've chosen. A calling is, this is what you do and you just happen to get paid for it. 
So you're reading about it nights and weekends. You're doing extra work, not because someone told you to, but because you thought of a way to make this better. You're not really looking for the next promotion or the next increase in money. You're so into just what you do because it's what you do. And so I believe everyone deserves the right to be great at something. In order to be great, you have to have some natural ability. You cannot be a podcast host and not want to talk. So if talking is hard for you, you probably shouldn't host a podcast. So you have to have some natural ability. I have a lot of natural ability around operationalizing things. I just can see the matrix. I know how this should work and I can put the pieces together pretty quickly. And then you have to have a passion for it. So if you think about like the best athletes, they have natural ability. I'm not, I can't hit a baseball. I don't have hand eye <laughs> coordination. I wear glasses. I'm not going to hit the baseball. But if you look at some of the best, I'm from St. Louis, Albert Pujols, not only did he have natural ability, every year he was the first person to spring training every year. And every player said he out hustled them all. He outworked them all. If there was a workout, he'd do it twice. If you were supposed to be there at a certain time, he was there an hour early. He worked because his passion was also baseball. So not only was he a naturally gifted athlete, he had a passion to be better. I think when you combine those two things, you have the opportunity to be great and the things you're great at start to point you towards what your purpose might be. So I look at some of the things that I have a natural ability to do. I'm fairly fearless. I can get on stage in front of people. I can teach classes. I'm not worried about wealth building or any of these things. And I'm a truth teller. I'm never not going to say what I believe the truth to be. Yeah. It's kind of hard to keep me from doing that thing. And yeah. so when you put together the fearlessness and the truth telling, I'm a good person to help remove this stigma because I don't have a fear around it and I'm naturally doing it anyway. And so I've always been an oversharer about things that go on in my life health issues, mental issues, marriage concerns, raising kids. You know, I remember after my first, my second child was born, I went to a follow-up doctor's appointment and my obstetrician said, so how's it going? And I go, dude, it sucks. I'm so tired of <laughs> have this baby. And he just started laughing and he was like, no one says that. And I was like, it does suck right now. I am super tired and I am wondering if I should have had this baby. <laughs> and he's like, I can't believe you said all that out loud. I go, more people should say it. Like, yeah. it's okay to think this sucks. It's okay to be tired. It's okay to question if you should have had this kid. You're tired and it sucks right now. Of course, you should have had this kid. You're going to be fine. Let's just move forward. But we shouldn't try to be like, oh, you can't say that. That's horrible. You don't feel that way. Yeah, I do feel that way. I do feel tired. And that's okay. So I really think as people are kind of moving towards their purpose, there's so many different things that you can look at. The purpose factor, you'll have to say the Icky guy. Icky guy. Icky guy. Icky yeah. guy. Icky guy. You can take tests to see what your Enneagram number is and, you know, what Myers Briggs you are and take the disc profile. And if you know someone at Keller Williams, we'll give you a KPA, Keller personality assessment, and use all of that to kind of say, what is this saying about me? And then if you're really brave, post to Facebook and ask people what they think your genius is. I did that once and it was really eye opening for people to tell me what they saw in me. Another quote that I don't know where it's from is the fish will be the last to discover the water because they're in it all day. So they don't know water is a thing. That's just where they live. So if you tried to tell a fish about water, they'd be like, I don't know what you mean. Um, mm -hmm. You are usually the last one to understand your true genius because you don't know it's hard for other people. I don't understand people like, you can't take a massive project and break it down into a thousand steps and put it in a spreadsheet and then figure out how you're <laughs> going to do this over the next two weeks. Like, just do it. Like I, <laughs> and then I have a child who has executive functioning disorder. He literally cannot do it. And so for me, I'm like, wait, everybody's brain doesn't work like this. Like, this is just how my brain works. Yeah. Really think about that kind of stuff. And what do your friends come to you for? So which friend are you? I always say, if you just got, if you just broke up with your horrible boyfriend for the seventh time and we all know he's horrible and he's been treating you horribly forever and we've all told you to break up with him a million times, 
I'm not the friend you call to cry because I'm going to be like, we know he's horrible. Why are you still dating him? I'm the friend you call when you've decided you really are going to leave him. You have a plan. You need to, to find a place to live. You need to do all these things. I will help you execute that plan. I will come to your house. I will pack up your stuff with you. I will move you out. I will tell him to get out of our face. I will take you someplace else. But don't call me if you want to cry. That's just not who I am. Not yeah. saying crying's wrong. You probably have a friend for that. But when you're looking at your purpose, ask, think to yourself, what do my friends call me about? My friends call me for solutions. <laughs> They're like, what, I'm ready to make a plan. What's the plan? And I'm like, here's the plan. They're like, oh, thank you. I knew you'd have a plan. I'm like, I always have a plan. I'm like the agent. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that because I'm the same way. I've never been the type where it's like, if you want to cry, I feel like I am a great shoulder to lean on. But it's like, I'm not a great shoulder and I'm realizing this more and more in my relationship, which makes it a little difficult. <laughs> but I'm not the best shoulder for someone to just sit there and cry. And it kind of sucks because it's like, I don't find my relationship, my girlfriend's a lot more emotional than I am. So it's like I'm having to learn how to be there sometimes for that. But it's like, also it's like, I'm like, let's go. If we're, we're either fixing this right this second, it, it, there's no grieving at no. all there's, there's no sadness it's like no. we, this is how my brain operates so it's like trying to unpack that has been quite the quite the journey but it's like i'm just so like let's go we're fixing this right now we're gonna make it better here's the plan let's do it let's go right now let's, let's step on it. the gas so there is a, a youtube video everyone should watch and it's about the nail in the forehead and it's a discussion between a man and a woman and the woman has a nail sticking out of her forehead and she's telling him about this headache she has and how her head really hurts and she doesn't know why. And he keeps saying to her, you have a nail nail. And she's like, stop trying to fix my problem. I just <laughs> want you to listen to me. Yeah. And the whole video is really about the difference between problem solving and holding space. And so one of the things I've learned very recently, and I'm not good at it yet, is if someone comes to me and they're starting to tell me about something that's going on, I'll say, pause. Do you want me to help you solve this? Or do you just yeah. want me to listen? And sometimes people say, I just want you to listen. Okay. Then I'm going to turn off the problem solving part of my brain because I'm going to want to jump in with solutions because that's just what I do naturally. And so that has helped a lot in like having just like deeper friendships about stuff is I can just listen, not for the seventh time you broke up with the boyfriend, but I'll listen the first <laughs> time. And then, then when we want to go to solutions, then we can talk about solutions. But I think that going back to wealth building, know who you are, because if you don't know who you are and you don't know how you are motivated and you don't know how you want to be held accountable and you don't know why you even want to build wealth, your success is going to be limited. If you can do the work to figure out who you are, how you are motivated, how you like to be held accountable, what this is all for, why do you want to build this wealth? What are you going to do with it? And then make a plan that fits who you are, then your success ratio is going to be way higher than attempting to follow my plan or your plan or Mark's plan, because everyone's plan has to be customized to them mm -hmm. or we're just not going to get anywhere with it. And then you have to also ask yourself the really hard question of why do I not do what I know I should do? And it's usually because you don't want to. So why do you not want to? What is holding you from doing that? You know, and it could be following a budget. I know I should follow a budget. Why do I not follow? What, why do I not follow a budget? I don't want to. Why do I not want to? What are my beliefs around that? What's keeping me from doing that thing? It can be the same about getting healthy. I know I should exercise more. Okay, then why don't you? Well, I don't have time. Is that true? How many hours have you watched television this week or looked <laughs> at your phone? Could you have a walking treadmill at your desk? Like, do you truly not have time or you just don't want to? I don't want to. Yeah. Why do you not want to? Exercise seems hard to me and exhausting and I'm out of shape and it's embarrassing and a multitude of reasons you don't want to, but until you deal with those, no plan is going to work. No, you know, economic engine, expense control, wealth building strategy plan is going to work if you're self-sabotaging in your head.
if your mindset is not right around this. So you've got to do that work. And that's why I think the purpose factor in books like that are so important. Yeah, and for anyone that doesn't know, we're not sponsored by this book. We just really enjoyed the book and reading it really enlightened us. We mentioned it like 70 times. So the book is an amazing book. I, I have to reread it because not only did I read the book, but I also went through all the 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 ex- exercises that it yeah. had to coincide with the book. So it's like it's a quick it's so look. It's a quick read. I talk about it all the time. I actually am in their coaching program, which is very good so far. They are good people. Like they go yeah. Facebook live into their group and teach. They're very much servant leaders of they just keep giving and they're finding success and their purpose is helping others find their purpose. So mm-hmm. it's it, and it's a quick read of a book. Like I couldn't really put yeah. it down because what it does, which is really good, is it talks about you. So yeah. you're like reading about yourself because it everything you end up with like four choices or five choices and they're like, okay, you're one of these five things. You're one of these five things. You're one of these five things. And there's something about it that draws you in because you're like, which one am I? What will this yeah. say about me? People love to learn about themselves. No, we're not sponsored by the book, but <laughs> love the book. And yeah. I think it's the key to a lot of different types of successes in life. Definitely. And Gab also just followed me on LinkedIn a couple of days ago. So I'm going to reach out to her and see if I can get her on the podcast because she reached out to me to ha- connect on LinkedIn. So I'm going to go shoot my shot later on today, actually. You should. You should say, out. I just filmed a podcast where we said the purpose factor no less than 70 times. So you should be <laughs> the next show to really talk about it because we're just like kindergarten level, the purpose factor. Yeah. She should You're come like... on and share her journey. Her journey is amazing. Yeah. And all of the different things that she has really accomplished in life. And she's very young. And so it's very, she's very inspiring. And so is her husband, Brian. They're both very yeah. inspiring people. Rebecca, we dropped a ton of nuggets this episode. I'm glad you were able to hop on. Where could we connect with you? Where could we hop into for the Wealth Building Group? I'm a part of it myself. So go ahead, plug yourself away. Where can we find you? Where can we connect yeah, with you? At so, so we can learn if more you about go you? to Facebook and search for Wealth Building 2.0, We have a group there, so you can request to join and I'll let you in. And it's not a super active group, but we do go live on Friday mornings at 7.30 a.m. Central Time for about 30 minutes to an hour, depending on how much Mark wants to say. If it's me, I'm 30 minutes. If it's Mark, it's closer to an hour. He's got a lot (laughs) lot of things to say. And then I am on Facebook, Rebecca Reich, R-E-I-C-H, Rose, and I love engaging with people on Facebook. So I accept most friend requests. As long as you don't send me some weird private message afterwards, <laughs> then I'll kick you off my friend request list because I don't need weird. Hey, how are you from strangers? But you're welcome to follow along on my journey. I'm really transparent about both my walk with God, my mental health issues and raising a family in 2023. Amazing. So now it's time for our famous five questions. So rapid fire, without further ado, let's get right into it. Question number one, what is the most impactful lesson you've learned in life? Keep your emotions between the lines. What is the most admirable trait a person can have? Authenticity. If you had to change someone's life with one book, which book would you recommend? The Purpose Factor. But really, if you're a person of faith, I'd recommend the Bible. Amen. What is the legacy that you're trying to leave behind? What a great question. You choose. You choose. Everything in life is you get to make a choice. And you may not choose what happens to you, but you choose how you respond to it. And that if you choose, God will work all things for good. But you choose. That's my That's what I want to leave for my kids and my grandkids and everyone who ever met me who just says, you know what? She had a lot of excuses and she could have said no, but I chose differently. So you can choose differently. You choose. And for anyone that wants to embark on their walk to wealth today, what is the first step that they need to take to get started? Join a group. Join a group that's thinking bigger than you. And it doesn't have to be Wealth Building 2.0, even though we'd love to have you there. But any place, any podcasts like this, any books you can read, any Facebook groups you can join, join groups where people are thinking bigger than you. Like I said earlier, you want to play a better game, play with a better team, and then be open to everything, but question everything. So one of the things Mark taught me was that there's a difference between salespeople and people who are educating you. So really be open to if someone's trying to sell you something just be wary. It's not that everything that is for sale is bad, 
just really think it through because there's a lot of free education out there around various viewpoints. And we talk about both Dave Ramsey and Robert Kiyosaki in Wealth Building 2.0, and they are diametrically opposed viewpoints. It doesn't mean one is wrong and one is right. It means you should understand both viewpoints and then do what feels right for you, but know why you're doing it. Be intentional with it. Don't just do it because you read one book. Yeah, amazing. Well, Rebecca, all good things must come to an end. It was a pleasure and an honor having you on Thanks today. For having I me. genuinely enjoyed this conversation. I hope you know I'm going to be stealing a lot of your nuggets <laughs> and implying that when I start talking about I think about I stole people. them all too. So just you can have it all. None of that belongs to me. It's all in some book I read somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> well, all righty. Thanks again for hopping on. Bye.